About a year ago, I was in Portland on a um, book tour for the Science of Good and Evil and kind of making the rounds of the usual talk shows. And I was on one TV talk show with a, a couple of people that had uh, produced a film called What the Bleep Do We Know? And it had just opened that day in Portland, just in one theater in Portland. And, you know, they were excited to, you know, sort of give me one of their DVDs and watch this great video. And it was about consciousness. And I thought, okay, hmm. All right. Are you guys like neuroscientists or something? No, we're filmmakers. Okay. And uh, anyway, so I watched it and uh, I figured, well, it's you know sort of interesting, I guess. And it's uh, it's an artistically, it's a nice production. Uh, but I didn't think it would go anywhere. Well, it's become kind of this cult hit film. It's played uh, all over America in hundreds of theaters, and they've made a lot of money. They did well, and and it's kind of generated this whole interest in consciousness being explained by, well, by what? By quantum physics and other things. What? Murray Gell-Mann here called Quantum Flapdoodle. Um, <laughs> featured in the film is the University of Oregon quantum physicist, Amit Goswami, for example, who says, the material world around us is nothing but possible movements of consciousness. I'm choosing moment by moment my experience. Heisenberg said, atoms are not things, only tendencies. So I wrote a column about this in Scientific American, and I said, okay, I mean, I challenge you to leap out of a 20-story building <laughs> and consciously choose the experience of passing safely through the ground's tendencies. <laughs> the film also features Masaro Emoto, the author of The Hidden Messages in Water. I don't know if you've seen this book. It's at most of the New Age bookstores. I've even seen it at Barnes & Noble and Borders. It's a sort of picture coffee table type book in which he, um, he takes uh, glasses of water and freezes them with a word taped on the side, just a, like a piece of tape with a word written on it, taped on the side. And the word determines, he thinks, the shape of the crystalline structures. So for example, if you tape love to a glass of water and freeze it, it, it has this really beautiful symmetrical crystal. If you tape, and I'm not kidding, Elvis's Heartbreak Hotel, you just write Heartbreak Hotel, the crystal splits, <laughs> Splitsville or something. I wondered what burning love would do <laughs> to that. The film's nadir is uh, none other than Jay-Z Knight. I knew as soon as I saw this that this was bullshit. Um, <laughs> If you don't know, Jay-Z Knight, she's an actress, in my opinion, that's all she is, is an actress, who claims she can channel Ramtha, a 35,000-year-old spirit warrior who speaks English with an Indian accent. <laughs> now, where they spoke English with an English Indian accent 35,000 years ago, I'll leave it up to the archaeologists to figure that one out. Um, it turns out, when I looked into it, the film was largely financed by her uh, group, whatever you call it, group, whatever, religion, whatever it is up there, the Ramtha, Ramthites up in uh, Washington. Um, uh, but they do feature um, uh, Roger Penrose and Stuart Hameroff in their, what is supposed to be a serious explanation for consciousness, which is that um, inside these little microtubules, which are these like little scaffolding inside cells, and neurons have them too, if there's something like a vacuum in there, and if it's not too warm and mushy, which brains tend to be, uh, there could be um, the possibility of like a wave collapse. The wave function collapses if it's stimulated by thought in a certain way. And that the quantum, I'll just read it what it's supposed to be. The quantum coherence causes neurotransmitters to be released into the synapses between the neurons, thus triggering them to fire in a uniform pattern um, that creates thought and consciousness. Because a wave function collapse can come about only when an atom is observed, that is affected in any way by something else. Um, it, it's, it's suggested that the mind may be the observer in this sort of recursive loop from atoms to molecules to neurons to thought to consciousness to mind to causing the wave function to collapse to atoms to molecules and so on. Um, well, okay, so that's a scientific claim. Is there any legitimacy to it? So I asked my quantum physics friends about this and they said, it's bullshit. And, uh, <laughs> But why? Why is it? I mean, you can't just say that. Why? Why? What's wrong with that? And as I understand it, quantum effects happen at a very small scale. Neural effects happen at a very big scale. According to Vic Stanger, 
in his book Unconscious Quantum, for something to be considered quantum mechanical, its typical mass, m, speed, v, and distance, d, must be on the order of Planck's constant, h. If m, v, d is much greater than h, then the system is probably classical, not quantum. And by his estimation, and I've checked with others on this too, uh, there's about a two to three orders of magnitude difference in size between these little quantum effects and neurons firing. So there's nothing there, scientifically speaking. Um, so, but, but why, why are they doing that? So I sort of concluded this column by saying, because they have this physics envy that, <laughs> that the arrow is pointing, arrow of causality points down. And sometimes that is the case, but other times the arrow points up. The arrow of causality points up. I think to explain complex systems, we need complex explanations, not necessarily physics explanations. It should be biology envy, not physics envy. So that, in, in part, is what kind of stimulated me to have this conference on this particular subject. Actually, having the conference was, was uh, sort of, I got talked into it by my friend Chuck Lemmy from Arizona, who's here today. After spending a month with him in the Galapagos, he had my ear bent on many a beach and mountaintop and said, you should do another conference. So here we are. Thanks, Chuck. And the idea of consciousness, well, okay, it's a big subject. I remember reading a review of Dan Dennett's book, Consciousness Explained, which is this huge book. And the reviewer said, he explained everything but consciousness. And, uh, and what's a philosopher doing explaining consciousness? Isn't this something that brain people should be doing? Um, so that's why primarily we have brain people here and not philosophers. Um, two examples, I'm going to show two short video clips and then we'll start the show with bringing Roger up and our speakers. Um, many of you have heard this story already, so I won't do the whole thing. But in 1983, if you recall from reading Weird Things, I was abducted by aliens. Uh, and this was on a lonely rural highway, you know, out near Hagler, Nebraska, which is always where these things happen. You know, they never happen somewhere where there's other people around uh, to film it. And, uh, you know, the bright lights, you know, shining on the side of the road and stopped me and the aliens came out and abducted me and I had 90 minutes of missing time. And anyway, that whole story. And, uh, so I explain this, and I, I give the denouement that this was in the middle of uh, a, a big session of sleep deprivation. I was in the middle of a transcontinental bike race, 3,000 miles nonstop, and I wanted to see, this was 1983, I wanted to see if I could go, 1982 was the first year, me and three other guys founded this bike race, and so I, I finished third the, the, the first year, and I wanted to see if I could go all the way to New York without sleeping from LA to New York without sleeping at all. Because I'd read that this guy, this kid at UCLA in the 70s did like 11 days without sleeping, playing uh, video, or not video games, but the, the, the little pinball games back in the 70s. So I figured, well, if he could do it, I could do it. Well, you can't, turns out. <laughs> Maybe you can do it sitting there, but you can't do it sitting on a bike. So um, I made it 83 hours and about 1,250 miles without stopping. and. Uh, uh, so th this is what triggers it, of course. It's, you know, it's physical exhaustion, it's sleep deprivation, and the aliens and all that. And in my case, um, th the aliens were people from a show. It was a television show in the 60s called The Invaders that were taking over people's bodies. And they looked just like real people, but you could tell that they were aliens because they had stiff little fingers. <laughs> How alien, advanced alien technologies can, you know, traverse the galaxy, but they can't, and cloning and everything else, but they can't bend their little fingers. That, anyway. Um, so I had inculcated into that m experience of the moment, right there on the side of the road, this memory from my childhood uh, of this TV show. It was really weird. Why would that happen? Well, so when I've been on these shows with the alien abductees, they say, how do you know it didn't actually happen? And the aliens planted the memory of this bike race and I've always thought, boy, that is really good. <laughs> but then I thought, how can I prove this? So I said, all right. And I went, just for this, just for you guys, I went and dug out the old ABC Y World of Sports tapes that I had from the show, from the race. They used to film the race every year. So I found the clip. It's, they, they weren't there with their cameras when I had the experience. But the next night, uh, when I crossed over the Mississippi River, they were waiting there with their cameras. And so we'll roll the first clip. It's just like one minute. Uh, and I'm talking about what happened the previous night. Now, you have to remember, this is 1983. I look rather different. <laughs> reached the Mississippi. What Diana and I hadn't known when we spoke of a close race earlier was that Shermer was slowing down. As he told Eric Hyden there on the bridge, he was wasted. 
still feel pretty mentally alert? No. <laughs> That's why I gotta get some sleep tonight. That's a very, very strange thing to happen to me last night. I mean, like, psychotic type experiences. Such as? Uh, thinking my crew was aliens from another planet trying to capture me. <laughs> Sounds ridiculous, but... <laughs> That's what I thought. He was still in second place, but he was floundering. And perhaps as he rode on into that damp, chilly night, he was second-guessing himself for participating in a pre-race decision that now appeared to benefit only one man. The race committee, of which both Shermer and Haldeman were members, had stretched the route northward in Illinois to make it go through Harvard, Lon Haldeman's hometown. It left a 200-mile dogleg in which the riders wouldn't make a foot of progress to the Okay. <laughs> they had a lot more hair then. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, obviously we have a physical explanation for this, but, uh, but what, what about other things? Okay, I don't claim alien abductees were sleep deprived, but if, if the same experience could happen under this set of stimulation, uh, it could happen under others because the brains, our brains are all wired in largely the same way. As another example of this, a second film clip I'll show you just as they cue it up. Um, is another guy trying to sort of stimulate these kinds of experiences, out-of-body experiences, near-death experiences, senses of presence, a guy named Michael Persinger uh, up in uh, Sudbury, Canada at Laurentian University. So when I was uh, doing the show Exploring the Unknown, we, we flew up there and, and I went through his lab, his sort of, uh, you put this helmet, well, you'll see. Uh, and he's trying to physically stimulate these uh, allegedly or apparently paranormal phenomenon. So here I've got about a six-minute clip showing what Persinger does and what he tries to explain, and then I'll make a few comments about that. He's on to something, but I'm, I'm a little skeptical. Well, so. Experiences that you have had are clearly very real. The question is, do they represent something out in the world or inside the brain? Here at Laurentian University in Sudbury, Canada, people are having these strange experiences every day. The difference, scientists are triggering them with, of all things, magnets. Here, in the laboratory of Dr. Michael Persinger, science fiction is rapidly becoming science fact. A motorcycle helmet wired to produce magnetic fields which influences the electrical activity of the wearer's brain produces ghosts, angels, and aliens. Since 1971, Dr. Persinger has devoted his research to proving that paranormal encounters are illusions created by the brain itself. Tiny changes in chemistry Minute alterations in electrical activity can create powerful hallucinations that seem absolutely real. These misfirings of the human brain can occur naturally, especially in the brains of intelligent, creative, sensitive people. Data collected from these kinds of subjects has formed the groundwork for a computer simulation of a paranormal encounter. We know that all experiences derive from the brain. We also realize that subtle patterns generate complex human experiences and emotions. So effectively what we did, thanks to computer technology, is we extracted the patterns, electromagnetic patterns generated from the brain during these experiences, and then we re-expose volunteers to these patterns. Okay. How much time do you think? Dr. Persinger's next volunteer, me, will be wired and blindfolded. I have plenty of time to reflect on what I am about to experience. A very sensitive part of my brain called the temporal lobes, located on either side just above my ears, is about to be bombarded with a series of electromagnetic pulses. The pulses will assault both my memory and my ability to unscramble information collected from my five senses. My brain is about to attempt to make sense of some very distorted signals. I sit in the dark in perfect silence for nearly an hour. And yes, even a skeptic's mind can start to play tricks on me. I feel a presence rush by me. In fact, I'm not sure that it wasn't me running past myself. I know it sounds crazy, but I really did sense that someone was in the room with me, courtesy of the magnetic influences being created on my temporal lungs. What's happening to Michael now is he's being exposed to uh, complex magnetic fields. The pulse being generated is that which is associated with experiences such as floating and pleasantness and spinning sometimes. Halfway through my hour. 
that, that's when I think that's what went by me. I wasn't sure if it was me leaving or somebody. There's something that came by me or something. It was very strange. And then in the second round, um, I did have it, it was the feeling like um, I was in sort of in, in waves, and then like I wanted to come out of my body, but it kept going back in. Yeah, I can really see how if somebody was maybe slightly more fantasy prone and tends to interpret environmental stimuli in a sort of paranormal way, this kind of experience would, would be a real wild trip. Certainly, uh, Dr. Persinger's research on electromagnetic stimulation of the brain that seems to produce some of these phenomena are really groundbreaking and very important in, in confirming what is believed amongst the vast majority of neuroscientists and cognitive neuroscientists that these beliefs, these percepts, uh, reside in the activity of the brain rather than in the external world. Temporal lobe stimulation may not be responsible for every encounter with the paranormal, but Dr. Persinger's research may be the first step towards demystifying a large number of age-old puzzles. 400 years ago, the paranormal included what in large part is now science today. So that's the fate of the paranormal. It becomes science, it becomes normal. about uh, the fate of the paranormal, that, that's true. In fact, I go so far as to say there's no such thing as the paranormal or the supernatural. There's just the normal, the natural, and all the stuff we have yet to explain with normal and natural means. It's supernatural, paranormal, it's just a linguistic place filler to hold there until we have an explanation. And uh, I don't know what else it could be. Of course, I, you know, I'm uh, you know, not in the majority of people who think that the mind may be somewhere else, and that's one of the things we'll be discussing today. So um, uh, my co-host for this segment, and we're going to move on to um, getting into the meat of this, Roger Bingham, uh, has thought a lot about this. He produced a beautiful series called The Human Quest on this whole question of uh, qualia, consciousness, mind, where does it come from, and the evolutionary origins of mind, and so forth. Uh, Roger's a member of the research faculty at the Center for Brain and Cognition at the University of California, San Diego. He's also associated with the Salk Institute in La Jolla there. It's a beautiful location. Uh, he's the author of The Origin of Minds, Evolution, Uniqueness, and the New Science of the Self, which I reviewed for the LA Times. It's a terrific book. There are a lot of good stuff in there. Roger is one of these unique, talented individuals that's into both science and clear communication, which is a nice combination that we need more of that. Um, and uh, so uh, after his series, that's uh, really triggered a lot of interest, I think, in the general public in looking for these neural correlates of consciousness and talking to, to scientists about that. So Roger is going to moderate all of our panel discussions today. I'll introduce the speakers. He'll moderate the panels. And he's going to help us kick off by giving us a brief introduction to the topic at hand and also showing some of his uh, clips from his terrific show. With that, please help me welcome Roger Bingham. <laughs> 